Sorry to interrupt, but it appears as though the presenters in the main room are muted and those of us online cannot hear you. Thank you. What what what, did, what happened? Uh, it, looks it appeared as though those of you in Dark Crystal were speaking and we couldn't hear you online as your system was muted. Thank you, Zach. Okay. We just will. I'm, I've just asked Anastasia to start over again okay, and I'll um, start over again. <laughs> hopefully you can hear us this time. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anastasia Eisenstadt. I am the founder of the Center for Alternative Conflict Resolution, where our mission is to reshape the future of diplomacy by using the full potential of the modern technology. As we stand at the brink of 2024, we find ourselves in a world where conflicts not only persist, but grow in scale and complexity. Everywhere we turn, the stability we took for granted seems under threat. With dormant conflicts reignite and new ones emerge, we are receiving loud and clear signal. Our traditional approaches to conflict resolution are not enough. Each incident shows the urgency to reconsider our conventional frameworks. But to truly grasp modern conflicts, we must recognize their metamorphosis. Today's conflicts, rather than being mere territorial or power struggles, intertwine economic, cultural, social, and political threads. They manifest as a reflection of deep rooted economic disparities, uh, the interplay of diverse cultures and systemic inequalities. Navigating this complexity demands innovative approaches. Technology doesn't hold all of the answers, but it offers us a powerful lens to understand, prevent, and resolve these conflicts. But before we delve deeper into the intricacies of conflicts, it's crucial to acknowledge the polarized world we inhabit today. A world where an unequal exchange of resources and opportunities has heightened disparities. This inequality not only fuels conflict, but also cements a vision of a fractured future. However, if we take a moment to re-envision our trajectory, we glimpse a potential path towards equilibrium. By promoting economic equality, we can shift from a realm of desperation to a horizon of shared prosperity. It boils down to a fundamental choice. Do we continue firefighting the consequences or do we address the root causes to sculpt a more just and cohesive future? This isn't merely a challenge. It's an urgent plea to redefine how we perceive and address conflicts. But before we delve into solution, allow me to hand the stage to Professor Professor Richard Rubinstein, a distinguished scholar who will shed light on the nuance and complex nature of conflicts. Uh, Anastasia, thank you very much. Um, and um, thank you all for inviting me to, to be here today. I want to apologize in advance for the fact that I have another meeting right after this, so I'm not going to be able to stay to very long to participate in discussion, but um, <clears throat> I'm happy to to talk about um, some of uh, my research on conflict and and much more more generally what's happening in the the field of conflict analysis and resolution. Um, I um, am a professor emeritus at George Mason University. Uh, I taught for thirty six years at the at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School uh, for Peace and Conflict Resolution at, at George Mason. And um, uh, my field, that is the field of peace and conflict studies, which, as you may know, um, is in a uh, it is it's in a very unsettled state uh, today, and it really has been for some time. I'll talk about a little, in a minute. I'll talk a little bit about what's what's unsettled it. 
Um, but first, um, let me say a little bit about uh, my own research. Um, I began uh, writing uh, books about political violence, uh, race riots in the United States originally, and uh, terrorism um, else around the world. Uh, and then wrote I wrote a number of several books on religion and conflict, uh, trying to deal with the question of why religious differences sometimes became so lethal. And I found myself writing about religious history, and I'm still doing that. In fact, my work in progress now um, is about uh, the first century and a half and the struggle between uh, Greeks, uh, Jews, and uh, Romans for cultural hegemony in the in the Roman world, but uh, just as Anastasia said, the fact that I, 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 it would be better if you muted yourself, folks. We're getting I'm getting interference. Uh, so if you're not muted, mute yourself, will you? So, so we don't get all this interference. Thank you. Um, um, anyway, in response to recent trends in our own country, and this in the U.S. as well as trends abroad, um, I ended up writing a book a few years ago called "Resolving Structural Conflicts," and uh, it was a uh, a book. Um, uh, a relatively short book. You can it's overpriced, but you, you can you can get a used copy if you want to see it. Um, it's uh, it's in paperback uh, and published by Rutledge. Um, in that um, book, um, I tried to confront the the, the, the following problem uh, that. Many people, scholars and practitioners in the field of conflict resolution for, for years have been talking about conflict in terms that emphasized the state of mind of the participants in conflict, and in particular, um, the, um, the way people can sometimes misunderstand each other. Um, the way people uh, can be motivated by um, uh, hostile emotions uh, towards people who they consider different from themselves and and so on. Um, and that seemed, I understood where that is coming from. And let me tell you, I'll give you a, a very a thumbnail history of the, this field of conflict resolution. It, uh, it begins after uh, World War II. Uh, with studies that are very much attuned to the kinds of conflicts that we were experiencing during the Cold War. So the, initially, a lot of the studies emphasized, uh, shall I say, rational calculation of interests. And uh, game theory was a, was, was a favorite theory to be used by conflict resolvers at that time. Um, and... Um, the link that people in the field discovered was between international conflicts, which were more and more in the nuclear age dominated by theories of deterrence, and domestic conflicts, which were seen more and more as conflicts of interest between various kinds of interest groups. Um, the... Um, uh, the the bad news about about conflicts based on a concept of conflicting interests is that you can get uh, zero sum uh, conflicts, which in which if you can't um, somehow increase the pie, uh, you get clashing interests, and they're, they're, they may be unresolvable. They can be perhaps manageable, but not resolvable. Um, the uh, good news from a theoretical point of view was that what was involved in conflict resolution was uh, rational decision making, which could be advanced by various forms of negotiation. Um, probably uh, the the book which 
was most influential toward the end of this period in which we were conceiving of conflicts as clashes of interest was uh, the uh, Roger Fisher Bill, Bill Urey book, Getting to Yes, um, which argued for what they call principled negotiation. And the first principle of principled negotiation is separating uh, interest from positions. Um, the, the moral was they are stop posturing, stop defending. Positions are very ideological and other. Otherwise, do an analysis which says what your real interests are and then you may be in a position to negotiate uh, well, um, uh, and so on. The assumption of all of this was that people understood what their interests were and that they could reason their way, and, and a very peculiar, I must say, by the way, kind of reasoning, a cost-benefit analysis, a very narrow um, definition of reasoning based on cost-benefit analysis. Well, it's... There was nothing really wrong with this approach to conflicts, except it was so limited. And uh, there were all sorts of conflicts, and as time went on, they became more and more important, uh, which simply didn't fit uh, the model of conflict of interest and weren't resolvable uh, in these kind of alternative dispute resolution ways. So, and the second wave, which I, I, when I came into the field in the 80s, uh, the dominant uh, thinking in the field, the most interesting thinking in the field, was being done by uh, people like uh, John Burton, uh, the Australian peacemaker, and others, um, who were had replaced a interest-based analysis with what they called a needs-based analysis. The reason that they had moved away from the initial model of the interest-based uh, negotiation was because they were, and Burton in particular, was trying to deal with conflicts that were accompanying the process of decolonization. And conflicts in which um, people, rather than uh, rationally sitting down and calculating their interests and negotiating their interests, people were um, fighting to the death uh, for reasons which seemed mysterious to, to rationalists and also exotic uh, to Americans or Anglo-Americans. Um, Burton, Burton himself was enormously sympathetic to decolonization struggles and uh, was one of the first people in the field to, to stop blaming people who had broken out and who were using violence uh, to try to achieve certain aims. When Burton and others analyzed what those aims were, they made a distinction between the aims that people were conscious of and aims which they were maybe unconscious of or semi-conscious of, which involved fulfilling basic needs. For, and in Burton's view and that of, of other theorists of the time, the most basic need was that of identity. So that people would fight give up their lives. Uh, this was no calculation of interest because it might end up, end up with you giving up your life. Uh, to satisfy needs for identity and recognition and security. And as Burton developed the idea, he added human development, human development, growth. Um, so this was an advance, I think, for the field. It began accompanying this theory of uh, conflict as uh, a method of satisfying emotional needs. Um, there was uh, also a method developed in order to determine what those needs were to help parties in conflict move from an interest-based to a needs-based analysis to determine what the needs were and to talk about what methods might be de developed, devised, or agreed upon for satisfying those needs, Burton and, uh, and Chris Mitchell and others developed what they called um, the problem-solving workshop. Uh, some called it the analytical workshop. Some called it the interactive workshop. I mean, there were various um, names for it. Hal Saunders called what he was doing sustained dialogue. But the 
the basic principle was the same. And the principle was that people, the parties to conflict, is particularly if they were left alone, if that, that is to say, if they were not incited to fight against each other by outside powers, uh, the parties to conflict were capable of doing this kind of analysis themselves and finding out what the conflict was really about. And it was not just about interest, te territory, money, some, you know, some, some obvious material interest. It was going to be about something le more, less tangible, but, 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 but no less important, in fact, more important uh, for many people than, uh, than material goods. And uh, the method was used sometimes with success. Um, the outstanding successes, I suppose you would have to say, were Northern Ireland. Uh, where the stage was set for the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland by a whole series of, of workshops, of problem-solving workshops. Um, also, Saunders um, went to Eastern Europe and Russia after the uh, decline of the Soviet Union and visited and worked in many countries where um, uh, ethnic violence was anticipated, especially violence between Russians, Ru ethnic Russians or Russian speakers and others. Um, and was, he was very successful in places like Moldova uh, in finding solutions to, at least temporarily, or for a decade or more, to those uh, problems. Um, so, um, so it wasn't that this method was useless by any means. Um, it was more useful in some places than in others. And the places which in which it finally struck me and, and a number of other people that it was least likely to work, the places where it was least likely to work, was where the conflict itself was not simply based on, shall I say, let, let me state that different. The conflict may might well have been based on unsatisfied basic needs, but the sources of the non-satisfaction were not being identified. If people's, first of all, there were more, more needs than identity had to be talked about. Um, Johan Dalton, uh, the Norwegian peacemaker, was instrumental in kind of expanding the concept of needs to include things like uh, the need for meaning, uh, the, need to, the need to have some concept of where one where one fit in, in, you know, kind of in the in the universe, um, and um, but even so, Galton's major contribution, it seems to me, was to point out that you could have a theory of needs and even a method of resolving conflicts involving needs that would work sometimes, but not get to what need, the place you needed to go to identify the reason that so many needs were not being satisfied. And if the reason was, did not lie in the relationship of the parties, but rather the reason lay in the system that embraced the parties, that included the parties. And when I say system, I mean a political system, which is really where, where Galton's analysis started, a socioeconomic system, which Galton recognized might have an important uh, role to play, although he didn't pursue that very, very, very as strongly as he might have. And a cultural system, and Galton was a great pioneer um, in developing the idea of cultural violence. So let me say something quickly about... The, um, the Professor Richard, we are running over time, so if you want to just give your closing remarks, and then we'll have to switch back to Anastasia. Uh, Thank you. I, I'll give. I'll. I'll finish what I was going to say. Okay, it's. Great. It's. It's not going to take more than a couple minutes. Great, thank you. All right. Um, what Galton discovered, and what I talked about, and tried to develop in my book, and resolving structural conflict, was the fact that the system itself might be generating the conflicts, and that if the system, political or cultural, or uh, socioeconomic was in particular if it was hierarchical, um, if it involved an, an artificial limitation of goods, um, not natural, artificial, 
uh, if it involved uh, an elite in power, either political, economic, or cultural, or all three, and discriminatory methods used to keep others from becoming, from entering that elite or to keep them down, then what Galta called very simply the top dog, bottom dog type of society itself was going to be generating conflict. And if that was true, then the implication, two, there are two implications. One is you would not be talking anymore just about direct violence as something to be avoided, uh, although it needed to be avoided, but you would also be talking about what Galton called structural violence. The, the, a systematic deprivation, which prevented people from realizing their human potential and generated the sources, generated rebellion, generated rebellion, and then the rebellion generated repression. So you get a cycle of re rebellion repression. Um, Secondly, the opposite, uh, the antidote to structural violence was not simply negative peace, the, the cessation of, uh, of direct violence, but what Galton called positive peace, meaning the creation of relationships so valuable that people would not uh, want to fight, want to use direct violence. Conversely, if you had structural violence, Structural violence produced direct violence and vice versa. Direct violence produced structural violence. And the third part of that triangle was what Galton called cultural violence. The kinds of attitudes, uh, teachings, uh, 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 ideologies, uh, cultural values, and so forth that lent themselves either the production of direct or uh, structural violence. So now the challenge to the field was not this is, this is not called to find the mediator and get the parties to talk about what's bothering them. The challenge was where in the system is this violence being produced and how can the system be changed so that it's not being produced anymore? Now what's necessary is system change. And as soon as you announce that, you then realize that our social science our political science, our cultural, our cultural studies uh, are very weak when it comes to answering questions like, what's the difference between a reform that really doesn't change anything and a high leverage reform that is the opening move in a strategy of system change? Um, stuck kind of stuck on the old uh, dichotomy between reform and revolution we what we're confronting in many cases is the is the need for change that is revolutionary and the question is how can you get it through basically reformist means if you if you don't want to have a, a violent revolution if you don't want to get everybody killed how can you get the have the effects, the revolutionary effects that are needed to, to um, get rid of systemic violence without uh, having the violent revolution itself. Thank and you, I'm, Professor. That's, that's, really, really right. that's what I wanted to tell you about. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Professor. Sure. To me a little bit for the time that we have left. And I would like to talk about the future that I envisage, and it's the one where technology serves as the great equalizer. Yet as we stand at the precipice of a tech-driven era, the very best chance of global peace lag in technological adaptation being linked to archaic data systems. Analog data methods in digital age do us no favors, tying our hands when swift and informed action is paramount. CACR endeavors to empower governments, global organization, and decision makers with impartial, comprehensive, and evidence-based conflict resolution strategies. We are designing a multifaceted software fueled by synergy of AI, macroeconomic models, and the principles of game theory. This approach offers an unparalleled understanding of conflicts, unearthing the subtle intricacies that often escape conventional analysis. It delves deep into the heart of conflict, shedding light on obscured interactions and critical dynamics. Our comprehensive tool is designed to tackle conflicts from multiple angles. 
what we call modules, economic dynamics that includes every party's economic stance and the overarching regional economy, military forecasting with predictive modeling of military outcomes, assessing potential gains and losses of a varied time scale, sociocultural dimensions, a deep dive into the cultural, social, ethnic, and religious factors that shape societal decision making. Global economic impact, which shows how global economies influence and are influenced by conflicts. Um, crowning our software is the unified superstructure, the deep learning game theory model that generates optimized solution or even potential treaties. Our emphasis on transparency is unwavering. Our objective is universal access to the same information, ensuring all parties can make decisions from a place of knowledge, understanding the repercussions of their actions. In this age of uncertainty, approaches like this are our torch bearers of hope. As the lines between technology and diplomacy will inevitably blur, we stand at a cusp of a revolution, but a revolution that promises peace, prosperity, and an equitable world. How did we find ourselves at the intersection of AI and game theory? Well, the mathematical discipline of game theory is grounded in the study of strategic interactions and decision-making, proving essential when we consider the often complex, interdependent nature of conflicts. It makes us better equipped to understand the motivation, potential strategies, and payoffs for all parties involved, be that directly or indirectly. While game theory provides the foundational logic of strategic interactions in conflicts, AI empowers us to process vast data sets, simulate countless scenarios, and predict potential outcomes with heightened accuracy. By employing these advanced algorithms, we can run game theoretic models at scale previously unimaginable. This merger enables us to understand the nuances of motivation and strategies in real time, accounting for rapidly changing dynamics in, and information. For instance, through the concept of Nash equilibrium, we can identify scenarios where parties acting in accordance to their national interests alone reach a point where no individual party has anything to gain by solely changing their own strategy. This insight allows us to pinpoint stable solution or highlight areas where intervention and cooperation might yield a more beneficial outcomes or underline where individual strategy might lead to suboptimal outcomes for all, jeopardizing the very purpose of the strategic move. If we talk within the framework of game theory, we move from incomplete information games to complete information games. When all sides to the conflict operate with more information and transparency, there is a greater chance for cooperation, more predictable interactions, and better opportunities for peaceful conflict resolution. Furthermore, AI capacity for deep learning means that as more conflict scenarios are processed and analyzed, our models become increasingly refined and predictive, adapting to the evolving nature of conflicts. It enables us to discern between a short-term tactical victory and a long-term strategic success, differentiating the end of hostilities from genuine conflict resolution. However, our commitment to technology does not mean sidelining human expertise. Ground insight, community voices, and cultural nuances are invaluable. Coupled with technological tools like sentiment analysis, we gain a holistic view of conflicts, ensuring our solutions resonate at the grassroots level. By processing vast amounts of textual data, natural language processing enables us to pinpoint prevailing sentiment, track emerging narratives, and detect underlying biases. Social media, which is a reflection of society's pulse, is passed in real time, ensuring we stay abreast of the rapidly changing discourse. In a world where, where a single tweet can influence geopolitics, the integration of NLP into traditional and social media analysis is not just strategic, but imperative. Through these advancements, we ensure that our conflict resolution approaches are always relevant, timely, and rooted in realities of a digital age. NLP allows us to dissect and understand languages, dialects, and even subtextual cues, ensuring no sentiment goes unnoticed. This technology transcends barriers of language, culture, shedding light on the emotion and perspective that lie beneath the surface. When paired with sentiment analysis, it amplifies our ability to determine the collective mood of communities, capture shifting sentiment in real time, and identify emerging patterns. Technology is only part of the equation. The true essence of conflict resolution is rooted in understanding. Unprecedented access to big data serves as our compass, guiding us through the layers of complex information. Meanwhile, social analytics acts as our enhanced ears and eyes, enabling us to listen more keenly and grasp the deeper nuances of previously unheard voices. 
it's crucial to engage with communities, to listen and to respect every voice. Every policy, every strategy must resonate with the unique fabric of each society. And as we, get, as we navigate the vastness of data, the integration of large language models into our approach adds a new dimension to our conflict resolution capabilities. Leveraging its power, we transition from the broad strokes of data landscape to the refined detail of data interpretation. LLM enhances accuracy and efficiency from data extract extraction, uh, cleansing, and preliminary analysis to the nuanced interpretation of the results. Besides presenting detailed scenario simulation, in our quest for innovative solution, the LLM emerges as an invaluable tool acting as the interpreter of our comprehensive model. It promises a level of transparency and collaboration previously unattainable. No longer will information be discussed behind closed doors. Instead, this technology fosters an open exchange and dialogue, leveling the playing field for all involved. Picture a diplomat or a key decision. Can we get to the slide where uh, the... Yeah. This one. And I use the example of uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, because uh, my pilot was supposed to be in Nagorno Karabakh but for the nine months, but we all know what happened, unfortunately. Uh, picture a diplomat or a key decision maker amidst a crucial negotiation turning to the large language model, much like one would turn to ChatGPT. With interactive Q&A features, they might post questions and receive real-time evidence-based responses. Instead of navigating through vast data repositories, they can instantaneously tap into deep insight, making informed decisions that impact nation, receiving guidance and explanation based on the analysis from our model. This is not just a tool, it's a transformative shift in how diplomacy and conflict resolution will function in modern age. The question which people pose most often to me is how do we guarantee the accuracy of our data? First of all, we use all of the tools at our disposal, meaning open source intelligence, data from our trusted partners, and third party commercial data. But I would like to pose a counter question. Why train an algorithm on perfect information in an imperfect world? Addressing prejudice requires us not to turn away from the skewed data, but delve into it discerning patterns and biases, and then devising strategies to counteract them. Look at, the, look at to the commercial world. In retail environments, sophisticated systems detect and predict purchasing intent by studying behavioral patterns. If such granularity of understanding can be employed commercially, surely similar insight can be utilized to identify deeper societal patterns and behaviors. However, to truly decipher global conflicts and their underpinnings, we need to a comprehensive model, one that plays bare economic ties, expo exposes illicit economies, and delineates the web of interactions. Only by mapping out this interconnected tapestry, we can fathom its complexities. While we might not change the intrinsic nature of humanity, we can certainly gain a more profound understanding of the causal threads. In doing so, we find ourselves better equipped to navigate human interactions and conflict, ever poised to steer them towards resolution. Of course, in our quest, several difficult questions might soon emerge from the horizon. My dictatorship emerge as a consequence of post-colonial oppression. Is the widespread economic deprivation today a catalyst for the rise in terrorism? When states feel marginalized, could this lead to a surge in nationalistic sentiment? And most importantly, how do we decide when to focus on fostering developing communities over inadvertently supporting oppressive regimes. But here's the twist. What if we had the tool that could not only pose those profound questions, but also uncover answers? A tool that can reveal patterns and connection invisible to the naked eye, allowing us to perceive the unseen, anticipate the unforeseen, and act more judiciously. Modern technology, particularly the fusion of AI and game theory, hints at this possibility. The gravity of our role as champions for peace cannot be overstated. It's crucial that we introspect. Can actions we take today reshape the course of future generations, potentially averting even more catastrophic scenarios? I firmly believe that the capabilities of modern technology can guide us towards these answers. But our responsibility doesn't end there. We've inherited a world tottering on the edge of tumult. But we have the power to bequeath a transformed world to the generation that follow. 
this is not just a debt that we owe to future generation, but an obligation towards those who are oppressed, underrepresented, sidelined, and marginalized. Reflect upon this. We had nuclear arms for decades, yet their use has been restrained given the universally recognized dire consequences. Military leaders rarely commit to confrontations without a clear strategy in mind uh, or an expectation of success for that matter. Now, imagine a scenario where these leaders could foresee the full devastating consequences before making decisions. Would that change the course of their action? Well, you no longer have to imagine. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry that I had to be rushed, but uh, I had less time than I had hoped, so I had to rush through it. Thank you. Of course, you're welcome. Any questions? But I don't think that we have the time. So. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I think we're going to move over to the second session mm -hmm. of this panel, so we'll take like a two-minute break. <laughs> Those who need to slide. I still want to reach out to that. There was a meeting. Uh,